My name is Tasos Ekstos. I'm a reader of earthquake engineering at the Department of Civil Engineering. And I would like to give you a brief uh, snapshot of uh, what we do in the department and in, in our group in particular. Apparently, as you know, civil engineering is maybe one of the oldest disciplines, which is good and bad in a way, because it looks a little bit you know, too conventional and perhaps a little bit old fashioned somehow. So there is a lot of discussion about really what civil engineering is. So practically, if we ask one of our neighbors, of our friends, what a civil engineering is actually doing, most probably they're going to tell us, well, they build buildings. That's what people think. And in fact, that's partially true. I mean, in the way that we deal with forces, we calculate the forces, and we drive the forces safely down to the ground. That's what we do, but that's also what a first year undergraduate student can do as well. But life, if we look around us a little bit more carefully, we will observe that construction and infrastructure is far more complex in size and in forms. And practically, we build a set of structures, portfolio of construction of different properties, being extended in space, being different in time, that we want to construct, maintain a model in the highest and more refined possible way. We also have in interaction between these lifelines, interaction of extended structures. And then we have all the mega cities that we live in just think that every day that passes, about 200,000 people move to a mega city. So, yes, we construct within these mega cities, but it's far beyond that because it's also about maintaining this infrastructure, extending its design life. It is also about ensuring their performance and their functionality. And this has a huge social, industrial, and financial impact. Apparently, this is a valuable portfolio. And it's a vulnerable portfolio as well. Exposed to natural hazards and man-made hazards. Exposed to all sorts of problems and disruptions. And, and, you know, structures fade like humans. So in this way, we need, that's what we do in our department, in our group. We need to find ways that we minimize the cost of keeping them functional. And we also make sure that they perform in the way that we want. So if I narrow down a little bit the scope of this presentation to what we do in the research uh, group of earthquakes and geotechnics, um, Professor George Milonakis is leading the group. He's here today. But the main thing that we need first to visualize before saying that we interact, of course, with all the UK and the European uh, industry and our uh, academic partners all over the world is also to think why, possibly, because I, I guess you really wonder, we care about earthquakes in the UK. Well, we know that earthquakes practically <coughs> don't happen. So, yes, we care. We care because, A, the potential impact of a disaster or even of, of a loss of functionality in the developed world, even for low levels of seismicity, is enormous, socially, financially, or in any other way. Clearly, don't be too much afraid. That's Fukushima, right? It's not going to happen in the UK. However, depending on the level of the seismicity, we have to make sure that things work as planned. Secondly, because we live in an international village. UK industry is very strong worldwide. They construct, they maintain, and they design structures all over the world, which practically means that half the world is exposed, or you know, if not geographically, at least in terms of density, half of the world's critical infrastructure is exposed to a kind of a seismic loading. Therefore, we have strong interest here as well in a group to do this in the most refined possible way. A third reason is because earthquakes, in principle, are complex, dynamic, nonlinear, stochastic. So whatever innovation we do, practically, we can very easily apply in the conventional world of vertical loading. These three reasons are why we deal with earth engineering in the UK, in particular in Bristol. But here we also have historical reasons. The University of Bristol has uh, developed the first shaking table in Europe, and the only one existing, actually still in the UK. It's a three by three shaking table, which is able to test replicas of structures, you name what kind of a structure, in horizontal loading of any kind. So you don't necessarily have to think about earthquake loading, and then test the actual performance in time. Secondly, you can see that this is the reason why a lot of tests have taken place with the nuclear industry. This is, I guess, more of a, almost a decades collaboration with a, a nuclear industry here in the Southwest. 
uh, trying to uh, identify, quantify, verify, and qualify the structural integrity of the components that are tested um, in the lab. Feel free to go and see and touch, or maybe don't touch. I think there's a label which says don't touch. So don't take it literally. But feel free to go outside and see how these tests take place uh, in our department and the group. And of course, this requires high performance computing, naturally, because the problem is very complicated. It also requires very high quality and high tech, high resolution monitoring of the displacement field so that you're able to know whether they, these micro displacements have taken place, whether there are contacts, there are you know, other phenomena that you need to model. Having this laboratory also, you may see that we can test all sorts of structures, reinforced concrete structures, masonry structures, steel structures, everything that we need to see in order to verify that the innovative ideas that we think are innovative at least really, really work in practice. So if we want to strengthen a kind of a construction component, if we would like to see the efficiency of an innov innovative idea, then the lab is the best place to do that. And we also extrapolate the ideas from the component level, which is a single structure, to the network level. In this case, we are dealing with natural gas pipelines, which are extended in space, and apparently you can solve deterministically, you can solve probabilistically, in any way you want. I mean, from a given scenario with all certainties, or for another scenario, a set of scenarios with a, a set of uncertainties, propagating from the scenario to the hazard of fragility, and ultimately to the risk level, so in this case, we can test, for instance, various scenarios for landslides, liquefaction, flows, whatever. But we have to think outside of the box. So since we do this analysis for the structural integrity and the risk of a pipeline network, well, it could be a water network, it could be a highway, it could be anything that extends in space. The hazard could be an earthquake, could be a flood, could be a landslide, could be anything that disrupts functionality, a car accident, anything that flows. So this means that we use the same generic concepts to solve the problem in various sorts of infrastructure, working from the very minimum structural integrity that is tested at the lab, propagating upwards to the network level. And then because we, we have an extended problem in space, sometimes what we've got is not enough. We have a three by three shaking table. We cannot really test a building in real scale, a bridge in real scale. However, we can test a component. And if we do that, and we substructure the problem in the hybrid testing that the, uh, the University of Bristol is one of the leading universities in the UK in hybrid testing, we can then split the problem in various facilities all over the world, like this is the case. You see here, for instance, it's working for a pipeline, but we have also substructure, a very big bridge. This practically means that we split the problem into a computational component solved somewhere in the around the globe, whereas we test another component. In this case, we test the facility uh, in Bristol, and then we test the outmost uh, edge of the pipeline in Patras. That, why? Because we tend to model what we know and test what we don't know. So material nonlinearities, contact problems, that is geometrical nonlinearities, strain rate effects, new materials, strange materials, Anything that we don't really know how to model, or we don't really believe what we do in numerical modeling, we test. And in order to meet the large scale, that's why we split the problem. It's a very efficient way of dealing with it. And of course, as I said, in terms of the pipelines, we can extrapolate the technique in real time, highway risk, and structural health monitoring. What does this mean that we do care to link structural health monitoring with the risk assessment? Why? Because our assessment in terms of risk is simply probabilistic. We have scenarios in our computer, but if we have measurements in real time, we can update. What can we update? We can update the intensity of the event, whatever it is in space. We can update the performance of the structure if it's monitored. So we've seen excellent presentations about telecommunication issues. Well, that can work, for in our case, for early warning systems. It can also work to give us the structural health of a system in real time. Because this, practically, can update all the predictions that we do, so that at the end of the day, when we have an event, we can predict, based on the models that we've got, where in space shall we expecting most of the damage. 
And having this expertise, the University of Bristol is very happy to be part of the um, UK Greek National Critical Infrastructure Research Scheme, which is a 150 million capital investment, out of which Bristol um, has secured 12 million funding to build the new solar extraction direction facility, uh, hopefully up uh, by 2020. So I guess that in the years to come, we'll be see uh, more of this. But it's certainly a great challenge to collaborate with other institutions in the UK. Last but not least, the University of Bristol is, I think, one of the leading universities in terms of global challenges and research in the framework for developing countries. This is a very different kind of research in the sense that this is research that has to be high-tech, has to be expensive, has to be you know, very, very uh, refined, but has also to be feasible to be applied in a context where there's no funding, there are no resources, there's no capacity to do things. So for instance, in this case, we are designing innovative ways based on the experience that we've got from California and Japan in terms of seismic isolation. We're designing schools that can slide on the soil on recycled materials so that perhaps they don't look very nice after an earthquake, but they remain intact. In this way, if the solution, the materials are culturally acceptable and you can resource them there and they can be locally produced and you can intervene in the culture, well then, yes, you can have high quality, high risk research for the people. And in this way, we have this, uh, we're leading this consortium of universities from the US, from China, all our Nepalese partners, and we try to do, to bring this change in the culture by bringing some innovative solutions for the country of Nepal. So, yes, to conclude, it is about forces, yes, but it's also about performance, it's about decision making, it's about risk assessment, and ultimately, it's about the resilience of the communities, of the people, the civils, the civil infrastructure, so that at the end of the day, every kid all over the world can draw this beautiful elephant, as our friends do in Nepal. So I presented a, a number of answers that we think that we've got, and if you have an interesting question, I'll be very happy to answer. <laughs>